the invitation to come back to, to Rome. Very happy to be here again. Uh, so my talk is not going to be about replicas, but I think I'm going to mention uh, at a certain point um, the connection with uh, dynamics, and uh, of course this is mo motivated by trying to um, have a, a, a nice and simple me method to derive uh, dynamical equations of the ones of the kind that Silvio used yesterday, and you know the ones that you know. So. Um, the work I'm going to tell you about has been done in collaboration with Vivian, who's here in the audience, and Fred van Vigelen in Paris. And we have another paper with a student which is in preparation, but I'm uh, only going to talk about the first uh, work. So what is it about? It's about trying to describe uh, fluctuating trajectories. So for example, here there is a sketch of a random walk. And uh, this random walk uh, is described by some Langevin equation that looks like this. So there is a blue part which is uh, describing the Newton part of uh, the evolution. And then there is the red part which has to do with the coupling to the bath and has a damping term and some noise. The variable uh, we're interested in uh, in this sketch is x, which could be the position like here, but there could be other variables that uh, follow evolutions uh, dictated by the coupling to an environment with a noise in particular. And this noise is the result of many small contributions from a bath, and okay, this is what I'm calling a noise. Now, I want to you know, build, again, a dynamic generating functional, a path integral, to describe uh, with it the evolution of this problem. And uh, just you know, for those of you who may not like path integrals, let me just list uh, a number of benefits of uh, you know, good properties of uh, uh, using path integrals to describe this such, such, such kind of uh, stochastic processes. Uh, in particular, for example, one can exploit symmetries and derive generic properties very easily from path integrals, like fluctuation dissipation theorems in equilibrium, or fluctuation theorems out of equilibrium, set perturbative expansions easily, uh, observe some formal relations between static and dynamics, and this is uh, replicas for those of you uh, who, who know about it, for example, via superfield notations in the case of the other systems, or uh, derive Schwinger-Dyson equations for correlations and responses like the ones that Silvia was using yesterday uh, with easy, easy methods. So, of course, uh, we all know from, uh, you know, old papers uh, that this has been done in the past uh, to construct these generating functionals, uh, but I want to revisit this problem for a particular set of uh, stochastic processes. So let me tell you how I came to this problem. Uh, actually, it was through you know, old collaboration with Gustavo Lozano in Buenos Aires, who, who told me about these kind of equations uh, that appear as a semi-classical limit of some spintronics problem uh, in many other contexts as well, but that was the context in which he was looking at this problem. And uh, it's just uh, you know, a block equation for the precession of a magnetic moment around some external field that I'm sketching here with this black arrow. And uh, this magnetic moment, okay, if there is nothing else applied to it, is processing around this, um, this field, uh, conserving the modulus and turning around. But then, you know, people have included dissipative effects and later noise effects in these kind of problems. And uh, in particular, the, the kind of um, you know, uh, equation I want, to look at, I want you to look at is this one here, the formulation of Gilbert, where dissipation is included uh, in this way, with this extra term here that makes the vector uh, turn a little bit towards the direction of the field and not process just in a perfect circle around uh, the direction of the field. Uh, so this term here uh, includes a la Langevin uh, dissipation into, into this problem, and eventually the, the magnet will uh, align with the field after a long time. Later, Brown in the 60s included noise, and noise uh, in this problem is uh, linked to you know, fluctuations that the external magnetic field can have, and uh, is this H here, which is uh, normally modeled as a white noise, so the components of this field in three dimensions, as in the sketches below, uh, are uh, zero mean and have correlations which are delta correlated in time uh, with some diffusion coefficient, d, uh, which is proportional to temperature. So if you look at this equation, because this is a cross, uh, it's a vector um, uh, product, uh, you see, uh, well, you see very clearly that H multiplies M, and hence this is an example of what is called multiplicative noise equations in 3D, but okay, it doesn't matter so much. The fact is that there are terms in this equation that uh, mix H uh, multiplied by components of, of M. 
So this is an example of, of Markov stochastic lambda Lichitz Gilbert Brown. This is the name it takes in the literature, multiplicative white noise a stochastic differential equation. And hence, their subtleties of ma Markov multiplicative noise uh, processes may apply or appear in this sort of, of problem. So what we wanted to do uh, well, some years ago was to write down uh, the uh, Martin Cijarros or Onsager Mahloop generating functional for this problem. And uh, of course, this problem can be written down in Cartesian coordinates, or it can be written down in spherical coordinates. So the Langevin equation I start with, uh, I can look at it in Cartesian coordinates. I can build the Martin Cijarros or Onsager Mahloop uh, generating functional with the methods we know for it. But I can also say, well, okay, let me transform to a spherical coordinates the equation, build the Martin Cicero's or Sager Machluck equation for, uh, sorry, uh, generating functional for the uh, spherical coordinates equation. And then I would like to be able to transform coordinates, transform, uh, you know, uh, variables from Cartesian to a spherical. If I do it at the level of the Langevin equation, I can, go, I can go back and forth and I see that everything works fine and you know, I do my transformation of variables and it's okay. But if I do it at the level of the generating functional, I see that I have a problem. Uh, I cannot go. Of course, I, I, will come, I will come to that in a second. So I can do it in any of these uh, discretizations that I will describe uh, later on when I get a little bit more technical. I can choose my discretization and go back and forth, and it works fine at the level of the Langevin equations. Uh, with the rule of transformation of variables that Itor, Satonovic, or Alpha tells me to, to use. This is a different difficulty. But this is a, diffi it's a different difficulty. It's a, it's a further difficulty, and you will see why it arises later on. I cannot do it at the level of the generating function. I have you know, the, the probability distribution of my process uh, in Cartesian coordinates doesn't transform into the probability distribution of the process in the spherical coordinates as it should uh, when I obtain both of them, starting from the Langevin equations, and con constructing the, the, the generating functions. So, you know, what's going on? Uh, so we noticed that, and we didn't have an answer for that. And then uh, we noticed also, looking at the literature, that this problem was observed in, in, in different contexts. Uh, so uh, in gravitational context by the, the wits, uh, in field theory, in statistical physics, mathematics, and so on. But we didn't find the, the explanations or the solutions or you know, the, the proposals, um, not, at least not clear. So we wanted to try to understand them uh, ourselves and try to find a solution ourselves. So this is what I want to tell you about. And instead of working with the problem of the magnets, which is a little bit more complicated because it's three dimensional and so on, let me go back to the simple case of diffusion and think about a particle diffusing in one dimension. So this is the position of the particle, this is a sketch in time, and there's a force and there is a multiplicative noise that I write in the usual way that it's written in the mathematical literature with this function of x that multiplies the noise that I'm now calling it psi. Uh, this is overdumped dynamics, I dropped the second order uh, time derivative and this is important for all these subtleties to arise. And uh, I have this multiplicative noise here, and it's white, so psi is zero mean and uh, delta correlated in this way. So now I go to Daniel's question, and uh, I want to be a little bit more precise with what I meant until now. So actually the continuous time notation that I used in the previous transparency is just a shorthand notation for something that I have to define. Uh, which is the way in which I understand this time derivative here, the evaluation of this force, and more importantly, the evaluation of this x of t in this function that multiplies the noise over here. And usually, uh, what this equation means is that I want to um, uh, update or you know, go ahead in time with the evaluation of the x at t plus delta t. Delta t will be an infinitesimal increment in time. Uh, by uh, looking at x of t and then you know, using the right-hand side as the increment in the derivative. And then I have to say where I evaluate the x which appears within the f and the x which appears within the g. And the e to Stratonovich or alpha discretizations, what they tell you is that you have to do an average between the values in the pre-points, in the post-point, and you can do it with different weights, uh, but always in this bilinear form. And alpha is the parameter that controls you know, how much weight you give to the pre-point or the post-point. Stratonovich is alpha equals a half, so you 
measure them in the same way. Uh, uh, why uh, alpha is equal to zero is the Ito um, um, prescription in which uh, this x hat is only depending on the prepoint uh, value. Okay, so this is of course reviewed in, in many books and, and, and yeah, books and review articles. And uh, okay, this is as a sketch where uh, you know x hat is some point in between these two and it's computed in this uh, average way. Okay, so this is fine, but now uh, if I do, as you will see, for any of these alpha discretization schemes, so one can make nonlinear change of variables at the level of the Langevin equations, go back and forth and find, uh, you know, the uh, transformed Langevin equation in the form that uh, you expect it to have, but you cannot do it at the level of the generating functions. And uh, the result found after that kind of transformation, nonlinear transformation in the generating function will not have the form that you expect. And I'll give you the technical details later. So before giving you the technical details, let me give you the solution that we found to, to being able to do these transformations in the path integrals, which is basically to go one step beyond in the discretization of uh, the, um, uh, the increments, uh, the, the values that you put in the x hats uh, within these two functions here. So basically what we say is that the x hat or x uh, overline x that you have to use uh, within this function here uh, is not only linear in the delta x, and it is for the case of, uh, for example, Stratonovich would be stopping uh, here and using this uh, expression for the, um, for the um, uh, variable of x uh, within the g, but go one step beyond and include a term that it's order delta x squared with uh, a function here that depends on x itself and it takes this form. So it looks very weird, right? So, but I will tell you why uh, this is a good choice and why this solves uh, the problem. And actually this kind of discretization uh, is known and has been used in the context of engineering where people also use stochastic processes. Uh, but uh, okay, I don't want to say much more about this. Uh, this is what uh, we, we, were, we are going to use. We did it with alpha one half. This simplifies uh, the. Uh, I, I'm sure it works with alpha one half, but uh, you know I'm not sure I will be able. I mean we haven't checked another case. Alpha one half is easier. With alpha equals zero, you don't need this. Yes, I need this. Yes, yes, yes. I need this. Any if I were to stop, uh, if I were to use any alpha of this kind, uh, you will see why I cannot do transformations uh, in, the, uh, in the generating functions. I'll, I'll show you the technical, the reason why in a second. I need this, yeah. Okay, so let me sketch the problem, the construction and, and the proof. Where is the problem in, in what I'm saying? So, uh, again, let's try to look a little bit more in detail into the, um, the equation, in the Lange of an equation, I try to you know, capture, understand which are the orders of magnitudes of each of the terms involved. So I'm working with a white bath. So if I'm working with a white bath because of the delta correlation of the noise at equal times, this means that the noise, uh, I have to think about it as being order delta t, the time increment, uh, to the minus a half. It goes like a square root of, of, of time, of time increment, because of the delta, direct, direct delta correlations. Now, if I look at the Langevin equation written in this discrete time uh, form, uh, I have the noise here. I put the delta t from the derivative uh, multiplying the noise. Then I see that this term will be order delta t to the plus a half, no? because I have a delta t times minus a half. I remain with a delta t to the plus a half. So this is the leading term in the right-hand side. You can, you can see uh, when you look at how does the increment in x behave uh, in uh, terms of powers of delta t. So delta x goes like delta t to the one half for the variable increment. Now, answering to, to Francesco for simplicity in what I'm going to say and also later convenience, I will take alpha to be a half in the following and then uh, the L xt in the usual uh, case will be xt hat equals to xt plus a half delta x. Now, uh, let me take a generic function, nonlinear function of x, let me call it capital U, and uh, let me calculate what would be the increment of uh, little u, which is capital U of x. Um, I evaluate it at t plus delta t minus little u, evaluate it at t. 
so how do I have to do this? Uh, well, I simply have to replace here in this uh, function the x of t plus delta t that the Langevin equation for x tells me to use. And now I'm using the linear uh, discretization, the usual one, uh, where uh, I'm, using to, I'm going to use the Stratonovich convention, so here I replace uh, by the x hat told by Stratonovich and also here. So if I do this little calculation, I replace here and I tailor expand in a small delta t and I keep the leading correction uh, to this expansion, I see that the equation that the lowercase u will follow uh, has the form of the usual Langevin equation that I expect for it, plus a correction that goes like delta t to the one half. Hmm? And uh, the forms of the uh, deterministic force, uh, I can compute it from the Taylor expansion, it looks like this. And the form of the uh, function that multiplies the noise, I can also compute it, and it looks the same, but with f, replace it by, by g. So this is what I expect from my usual change of variables, because I'm working with a Stratonovich, and I could check that for a Stratonovich, usual uh, changes of variables work in the usual way, like for uh, continuous differentiable uh, functions. So I obtain uh, the equation that I expect to obtain for u if I take delta t to zero and I neglect this correction term. So in the continuous time limit, I can do normal changes of variables in the um, uh, Langevin equation level and uh, you know, get what I expect uh, when I drop this term. If I don't drop this term, I have a correction of the delta t to the one half um, that is going to be important. Okay, now, why does the change of variable that I'm pro usual change of variable that I'm proposing here doesn't work at the level of the action? So, for those of you who remember the structure of the uh, onsager mach loop action, uh, you just have to remember it. For those of you who don't know it, believe me that there is a term in the action of this distribution function that I'm looking for that looks this way. So it looks like delta u delta t, so it's like time derivative in discrete time of u squared, with a prefactor here that goes like delta t, and there is something else here, which is this function g, uh, that is not going to be very important for what I'm going to say here. What is important is this delta u delta t squared. So now, if uh, I apply the change uh, that Stratonovich tells me to apply, for this delta u, I, I get something like this, but I have the correction. I have the correction that goes like delta t to the one half, the, one, the same as I was mentioning before. And now if I look at this term squared like this, I realize that there is a squared term of this, which is fine. There is another squared term of that, which is fine. But then there is a double product. And what happens with the double product is that you see in the double product, the delta t's cancel. The uh, delta x times this delta t to the one half appears here. But delta x, I told you that it was order delta t to the one half as well. So this double product is order delta t. And in the action, I have to collect those terms being order delta t to build, as you remember perhaps, the integral over time that will appear on the action. So at the level of the action, I cannot drop this order delta t term. I have to keep it. And this is a term that will not take the form, does not take the form of the action that I wanted to recover because the action that I wanted to recover had to be uh, just given by a delta x to the square, just delta x delta t, uh, the time derivative squared appearing in the action for x that I wanted to get. So the, it's just a question of you know, having, uh, being careful with the orders of magnitude of each term in this uh, Taylor expansion, do it carefully, and noticing that at the level of the action, I have to keep other terms which are other delta t, uh, that while at the level of the Langevin equation, I had to, I could drop those terms. I mean, they will disappear, those terms are not important. Mm -hmm. So the action is more, uh, okay, more sensitive, I mean, it's sensible, no, so it, I mean, it, it feels, uh, higher orders of corrections compared to uh, what happens with the, with, the Lagrange, with the Langevin equation. Now, why this problem is solved for the new discretization? Because if I do carefully this calculation at the level of the Langevin equation, I again derive the equation that you satisfied replacing here x of t plus delta t by this expansion going one term 
one other beyond the one that is here, going one other, going one other beyond in delta x squared, and you choosing this beta g to be of this form. Well, the other delta t squared to the one half, I cancel by this choice of beta g, and uh, the equation becomes exact up to corrections which are of the delta t. Now, not delta t to the one half as it was with the previous discretization. So have, I have proven uh, the, um, the precision with which I can change variables at the level of the Langevin equation. This is not important at the level of the Langevin equation where I take delta t to zero uh, limit compared to the usual Stratonovich one, but it will be at the level of the action uh, even in the delta t going to zero limit. Hmm? So the corrections now are order delta t. So in the delta t going to zero limit, the improvement is irrelevant at the level of the Langevin equation, unless you want to do numerical solutions of the Langevin equation, and then uh, you improve the uh, accuracy of your iteration uh, or integration of the equation. But uh, it's, it's relevant it's relevant at the level of the action, even in the delta t going to zero limit. This is the point. The, you know, the choice, this form here, it also depends on the choice of alpha equals to one. So for the moment, we only have uh, one half. So we have only done it for alpha equals a half. Uh, so we have to check whether, you know, you can also do it for other alphas. So in Langevin, alpha equals zero would be much Of course, yes, yeah, yeah, it's so. true, it's true, yes. So in the way it's written, Langevin, it's, uh, it's implicit, no? In the, in the, yeah, but okay, yeah. Indeed. So, so what is it for alpha equals zero? Sorry? What is it for alpha equals zero? We didn't do it for alpha equals zero, so I cannot tell you, you know, whether there is a beta g of this kind. We kept, it looks we, exactly like the term that comes in for the Ito calculus normally. No, no, it's not. No, no. But it's, the same, it's a similar form, right? With the, um, the, so I, I, I no, 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 it's, it's different. It's different. It's different. From the, this is, uh, this is dependent. You see, it depends on the function that multiplies the noise in the Langevin equation, so it depends on the g. That's the specific way that it's written, but it's not. I guess I... No, no, it's, it's different, it's different. It's not uh, the, that thing. Okay, so let me just sketch how this solves. Yeah. I agree, but it, when you start to write, read those papers, you don't understand a word. <laughs> so, uh, and you never see which is the discretization that you have to use to get those results. This is just, you know, it's very schematic as a construction. I tell you which is the discretization that you have to use to get an action on which I can do transformations of variables, uh, you know, blindly. And I tell you how to construct it. Uh, in their cases, I, mean, I, I can assure you that we read all those papers and, you know, <laughs> yeah. So, what happens at the level of the action when you define it with this discretization? Well, basically what happens is that uh, the extra terms that you get uh, because of the transformation of variables uh, go like delta t to the three halves. And delta t to the three halves is not delta t, so it's higher order in delta t, so in the limit of delta t going to zero, they will not contribute to the integral. Okay, so then you can, you can drop it. And the reason basically is that now, uh, you know, the correction uh, of, uh, by, of the change of variables is order delta t. When you do the double product, uh, this will be higher order, and, and then you can, you can drop it. It's not order delta t. So the double product, uh, it's, uh, it's negligible. So uh, what ha have we done? So what we've done is to write the uh, Langevin equation in a discretized uh, form uh, that is this beta g discretization uh, scheme. And now I write it here with a s on top because at the level of the continuous transformations, yes, uh, it works because of this choice of alpha equals a half in the linear delta x term. It works like Stratonovich. So at the level of the Langevin equations, I, I, I just can think about this discretization in the continuous limit as the Stratonovich uh, scheme. So then the usual chain rule for the changes of variables at the level of the equations uh, apply and, uh, and everything is natural here. 
Uh, but then when I construct the action, I have to use this beta G discretization, say that I use it for X, and then I get an action for X, I use it for U, I get an action for U, and then I can use this uh, same chain rule at the level of the actions, and everything is fine. So how do these uh, actions look like? Uh, well, they look this way, so let's look at this continuous time uh, writing that I have here. Uh, if I were using the usual Stratonovich uh, scheme, I would have more terms here, and those terms will not be uh, you know, uh, transforming as, as I wish, uh, so or they will be given right, wrong results or yeah, problems with the covariance of, of the dis distribution. And the, uh, yeah, the action is more sensitive to discretization details than the Langevin equations. So this is the form for an Sagar-Mach loop. Uh, I have the form for, um, oh yeah, I want to say that this continuous time writing appeared already in the literature in many places, in particular in Graham's papers from the 70s. Uh, but as uh, you know, I was answering the question to, to Silvio, uh, I mean, it's very difficult to understand how they, uh, they obtained them. Uh, this is just more schematic and you know, it's, we understand what we are doing. For Schunger, for Martin C. Rose, uh, there's also a, a writing that looks like this. Uh, and then what can we say? Well, we could say that here we, I, I just pinpoint which are the terms which are new. And G is the factor that multiplies the noise. Uh, G prime is the derivative of it. So you can see that if it's a constant, these terms disappear. But if it, there's, G is not a constant, they are there. And uh, this is what I, I had. So to conclude, uh, so we are happy with <laughs> our construction. Uh, we understand what we are doing, and I think it's very easy to, to follow. It's just Taylor expansions uh, done with uh, care. Um, now, um, what do we want to do? Well, we want to uh, extend this to higher dimensions, and this is work in progress by, by Thibault. In Paris, uh, there's uh, some subtleties about the higher dimensional cases that we are dealing with, but OK, it's uh, just uh, it's some more work. Uh, what can we do with uh, all this formulation? Well, for example, we can revisit in the context of the interests in, the, in, in this conference, uh, the supersymmetric properties of those actions, uh, of those generating functions. So there's work uh, by uh, Vivian, which is related, dealing with KPZ, and that, okay, that could be of interest in this context as well. Uh, but then we can also say, okay, let's apply it to a physical problem and see, see what's, um, uh, what's going on. In particular, those, uh, uh, Landau, Lifshitz, Gilbert, and magnets that I was talking about at the beginning, uh, but there are also problems of interfaces uh, which were of interest to, to, to Vivian and, and, and Thierry. Uh, so interfaces with uh, internal degrees of freedom and, and try to see, uh, you know, do the uh, dynamics of these problems carefully. Uh, those problems have multiplicative noise within, so it's, uh, these terms will be important. Thank you. Exactly. So this correct, everything is trivial in the case of white noise, or there is still some correction? Additive noise, noise, you mean? Additive noise. In the case of additive noise, uh, the, all these uh, subtleties disappear, and uh, you know all these new terms uh, in the end are proportional to G prime, so uh, they go to zero. Yeah, but it's in the multiplicative noise case that you have to be careful. Yeah. yeah. Yes, please. Uh, it's related because you see that when I talked about what happens at the level of the Langevin equation uh, in the discrete time, uh, you make your Langevin equation one or the delta t to the one half better. So uh, it's a way to improve the accuracy that you're going to, to have with your Langevin equation. But then as a uh, Federico was saying, is written in a not so convenient way, the Langevin equation with this discretization, because it's implicit, and uh, okay, then you have to solve the implicit problem at each time step to go ahead. So in this sense, you know, it's better um, concerning the order in the error that you make, but uh, then you have the implicit problem to solve. So you lose the practicity of the ITO formulation. Any other question? Uh, there was part of yeah. No, I think you. Uh, I think you don't have problems in that case. So uh, yeah, this is a. Uh, 
Yeah, but I don't think exactly, I don't know exactly how, you know, the crossover uh, has to be dealt with uh, in, in those cases. Uh, so, yeah, I wouldn't, there, I don't know, Vivian, if you want to say something else, but. Okay, so no more questions. So thanks, Leticia, again. Thank you.